Hi, Six Snipes here. I used to make Sandstorm content, and about a week ago you might have noticed that I've stopped and I probably owe you all an apology. Yes, my real life is busy, but I've had time for video games. It's just that instead of Insurgency, I've been exploring something else as of late, and today I'm here to talk to you guys about it, and boy do I have a lot to say. This is a new series. This is a new game. Today I'm bringing you a critical look at Destiny 2 Beyond Light, a disappointing expansion for one of my favorite games. Let me tell you a story. I don't only play Insurgency Sandstorm. It's not true! That's impossible! In fact, it's not even my main personal game. There's three titles I have under my favorites in Steam. Three fantastic games which to me define innovation, defy stereotypes and development pitfalls, and are the quintessential icons of games which have made the biggest impact on my perspective of gaming as a whole. Insurgency Sandstorm isn't even on there. Come in. Come in because this is a representation of the most elite, pinnacle, game-changing, and frankly awesome iconic additions to the world of gaming as a whole. Fallout 4, Game of the Year Award 2015, my first Bethesda game, and an icon of open-world RPGs. Rainbow Six Siege, a game which said we can make tactical realism cool, and popularize the genre of slow-paced, high-tension action despite a rocky launch. And the subject of the day, Destiny 2, perhaps a game I've invested the most in time-wise and monetarily. Bruh. I love the Destiny franchise. I never owned a console and didn't play the first, but I was ecstatic when it was slated to premiere on PC, even if it was a month after the console releases. <laughs> I played through the main story year one, and have done all the DLCs and main expansion quest lines. I've killed everything from Dominus Gaul, the False God, to the Cosmic Worm Zol, an actual god. Fetch me their soul! Amazing AI modes and mechanics, challenges of the highest order in the form of nightfalls and raids, and incredible PvP are to the tip of the iceberg for what this game had to offer or what this game was, because having played through the campaign and seeing a lot of what the newest expansion Beyond Light is about, I've come to the conclusion that Destiny isn't what it was anymore, because Destiny 2 Beyond Light is a sellout. Now, there was a lot going against iconic game developer Bungie to begin with here. Subpar performance and ratings over the past few seasons of content, sparse release of anything actually considered fresh and new, little to no narrative progress debuted in a way that interests the fanbase, and crippling deficiencies in sandbox balancing all plagued the game within the last year alone. This is fine. It's not entirely their fault either, having just split with Activision and subsequently canceling plans for a third installation and trade for the release of more expansions to the original game. This was that, the culmination of their work as a solo project, the icon of an era devoid of the stingy restrictions and red tape put up by a larger company. This was what Bungie could do with support of a loyal fanbase and the freedom of expansion they haven't had in years. I bought this. I bought this expansion for what would otherwise pay for a full price AAA gaming title, and having spent a good number of hours in the world of Beyond Light, I, I kinda, kinda wish, wish they, they just, just made, made Destiny, Destiny 3. 3. This expansion is bad. It's not just bad, it's almost a joke. The fact that this update plus a year of content is as expensive as the game at day one launch is a pathetic and poorly phrased insult to myself as a consumer, and while I know I can't speak for the whole community, I have to say it for the people like me. Destiny 2 Beyond Light is an all likelihood my last straw because this game that I love sucks now and I'm gonna get into all of it. Firstly, before I tear into this expansion anymore, it's entirely unfair to do so without saying what Bungie did right and I'll do it right here. A lot of things improved in Beyond Light. Firstly, and most noticeably from the moment you load up the screen, you instantly realize how much better this game looks. Gone is the artistic bright white map textured backdrop that burns your retinas and illuminates your room at 3 o'clock in the morning. Instead, we get Destiny Dark Mode, as I like to call it. From what I can tell, all menus and UI you can pull up are now in a blackout emo phase, and it's never looked better. 
it really just seems to bring out the color in everything as well, but I know they've also worked hard to change up colors, textures, and lighting on countless assets and it's gorgeous. For the first half an hour, that's all I could think about too. Second, Europa and the Cosmodrome. Bungie was right to add both these areas, I actually quite like both. One which was present since the beta of the first game, as a nod to all the veterans out there, and one that's brand spanking new, complete with phenomena we've never seen. Wild enemies, unprecedented visuals, snow physics and storms which actually go as far as to impair vision and even blow around your sparrow when it's in a neutral position. Make no mistake, this is an incredible world that lives and breathes and you can feel the depth and effort put into it by the devs here, as with all good open worlds and the planets and moons we've seen before. Third and final, more spotlight and interaction with genuinely intriguing characters like the Exo Stranger making a return from D1 and everyone's favorite space daddy, Varix. Uh, aside from this, it's pretty much garbage. I have three primary complaints as well. While I spend about a minute summarizing all the three good things, you can expect me to give each and every one of these points at least as much time as all the pros combined. Number one, what I expect most when I pay full price for anything in gaming, a good story, and this is not that. You guys have never seen me give an overview on anything but the numbers on my gun's intel page, so it might be a shocker to you that I'm actually a huge fan of narrative and a massive critic of mediums such as books, movies, and especially video games. When you have the ability to provide the audience an experience where more than observing a plot, they can tangibly interact with it and affect it, you're allowing the introduction of plenty of game-changing and frankly earth-shattering elements, and yet Destiny seems to never get this right. I'm a huge fan of the lore of Destiny. I own the hardback comic book collection and both grimoires, and fully intend on buying volume 3 when it's finally released. Why? Because the people who write these are fantastic and clearly care about the game and the fans. So why is it that these people aren't in charge of making the campaign's plot is completely beyond me, because whoever's doing it hasn't made a good story in 3 years. Destiny 2's main questline tries to be the most accessible, generic, recognizable experience for every Everyone, and while it achieves this, fails to stir any emotion whatsoever. You, whoever you are, play a character who speaks less than Master Chief and has less memorable lines too. Instead, all of your thoughts and desires are expressed for you by a milquetoast beta male depression prism who isn't even voiced by Peter Dinklage anymore, so literally has no points of interest. <laughs> Everyone around you is very not helpful. The majority of the marketing includes Cowboy Chad and Living Cringe Post Drifter, Green Magic Goth Girl, um, what's her face, and most prominently the aforementioned fan favorite Exo Stranger. She's the robot you wish was accompanying you on every mission. There's like one cutscene with these three, then you sort of talk to Dollar Store Nebula for another couple times, something something, resist the dark side, and then they send you on your way. Bruh. In fact, I'm fairly certain the cutscene you see in the first trailer is literally longer than all the scenes with them in the actual game. No delivery of expectations. You know they say a hero is only as good as their villain, and believe me, we're gonna need one doozy to fix the gaping empty hole we have where they're supposed to be a protagonist. Now Aramis, with a name that sounds like it's from a character in a crappy half-finished D&D session, is not gonna be this villain. I guess the plot makes her out to be some well-meaning leader of a long-suffered people who's taking the low road as a means to lift her kind from the grasps of desolation. Papa Varix, who you spend the majority of the campaign discussing this with, insists she at least meant well at some point and then somewhere along the way joined the dark side or something. Oh no! What the fuck? Regardless, this shatters the rule of show, not tell, because we're hearing all these nice things about her while she acts like nothing but an insufferable toddler. The only matter I do not take seriously, boy, is you. Your politics bore me. Your demeanor is that of a pouty child. And apparently... Bro's daddy Varix. <laughs> 
Now, what's most frustrating is that this could be a great story. The road to wrong is paved with good intentions. This is a theme that is constantly struck in the fantastic storyline of Forsaken, where you find yourself savagely murdering every single one of the people even remotely responsible for the death of the only character anyone in the fanbase actually cared about. It's not like it's impossible to make a fantastic villain under these conditions, it's just the writing is bland, it's lazy, and the plot points are so benign and understandable that an 8 year old could get off Fortnite night, play through the game for a couple hours, and summarize the whole thing in one page book report. This issue is only made more obvious if you've read any of the extended lore or stories from people who probably get paid way less to write way better narratives, but whatever. On to the next point. Number 2. Balancing. What? What the fuck? More specifically, the lack thereof and the thinly veiled execution of a pay to win economy within a game that gets away with marketing itself as partially free to play. Let's talk about stasis. So once you're done playing the thoroughly uninspired campaign, you've unlocked a fourth subclass. The first three are available to everyone as light-based abilities and are perfectly fine. There is inconsistencies and some are definitely better than others, but for the most part, we had what I thought was a quite nice meta of checks and balances between all of them. Introducing the dark boy powers of ice. Instead of taking time to master the fine-tuned mechanics of a light-based skill set, why not just equip the shiny new abilities you paid for and go treat the people not using the same like actual smurfs in PvP and outclass every other subclass in PvE. It was at this moment that he knew. A lot of people have complained about stasis being completely overpowered, and while some have said let the dust settle and we'll see how many people learn to adapt to this, I think the dust has settled just fine. It's been over two weeks since the release of stasis and it's becoming more and more obvious how completely unfair these abilities are and there's no way the devs didn't pick up on this when they were making them. No other class has the ability to freeze you in place, no other class can stall out powers and even supers as consistently as this, and no other class counters virtually every ultimate in a one-on-one -on -one battle. Okay. The Word of Dawn, otherwise known as the Invincible Shield of Death, renowned for being entirely unpushable, no matter what super you have, with few exceptions at all, is the benchmark of being able to stop any sort of momentum the other team may have in their tracks. And yet every single ult from Stasis busts through the bubble like it's nothing and bodies you harder than a bus. You can just drop f***ing dead. Every single ability from these new classes is capable of freezing you in place, forcing you to hold the default binding of V, which is also shared with the cast utility ability, meaning that if you get frozen, not only are you totally screwed, but if you somehow by a miracle manage to not get shotgunned while unlocking yourself, 50% of the time you're gonna cast and waste whatever ability you may have otherwise been saving just because you held V for too long. How could this happen? Well done, Bungie. Truly fair. I love loading into a lobby where every single player except for myself is using stasis and being complete crayon munching preschoolers stomping on everyone without ults like their little plastic army nope. men. I feel sorry for the free to play people who haven't bought this stuff, I really do. Supposedly they gutted the most vicious offender of this, the warlock subclass, however I played the day of the update and well after and I can say it still destroys in pvp so I really don't care if it does less damage to your strike bosses, broke is broke. I'm gonna point out that all the people who started to use ice that got their ults late because they're bad. It's also worth mentioning that anything above the base level of the game will give you both fantastic XP boosters, putting you comfortably in front of everyone else, as well as the special edition access to the no time to explain exotic pulse rifle, otherwise completely unobtainable. Equally ridiculous is its performance in PvP, and I can't tell you how many times I've been shredded by this thing. So I guess if you're free to play, you can look forward to not having the ridiculously overpowered of the gun of the season until it's nerfed either. Oh, you almost had it. You gotta be quicker than that. I wanted to get into the competitive modes, however, the influx of hackers in previous seasons was daunting, and this just seals the deal. Number three and perhaps the most egregious offense to both me and the Destiny community as a whole. Sunsetting. 
Now maybe you're here for the sandstorm content and are still hanging on all the way through this video, so thanks and I'll explain just for you, you wonderful one singular person. You see, when a game developer has a trashy weapon sandbox that's frankly on fire and basically balancing seems like a huge issue despite, despite the, the fact, fact that it's, that it's their, their job, job, they might just decide that taking the time and effort to ensure a balanced and fair game economy sounds like a lot of work, so instead let's just effectively neuter every single gun and item that's not from the past half a year of content. And then Bungie called it sunsetting and pitched it to the community. Suffice to say, nobody liked it. Hey, uh, just was wondering, is this uh, an out-of-season April Fool's joke? But that's what we had to do in Beyond Light, because that's what Bungie had to do to fix their game and give us the experience we deserved. So we got it. Except for the fact that the guns still need to be balanced, because that effect doesn't take hold in certain activities, mostly, namely, PvP. <laughs> Where people were complaining most about balance to begin with. What did you really do, Bungie? What did you accomplish? Congratulations, you played yourself. You played yourself, you didn't make your fan base happy, you didn't fix the issue. Oh, now you fucked up! Do I need to say more? I actually do, because beyond the metaphorical castration of all the beloved weapons and armor fans were holding onto for years, look on a mask with my boy. So we were treated to the mass removal of content on the basis of there is not enough room. Now let me put it this way, I know people who reformatted and wiped their entire hard drives to fit the next update of Call of Duty Warzone, which isn't even an entire game by itself and is still larger than Destiny 2 by far. You really don't think that if your fans don't have the room they won't make it? People can be dedicated to games and removing content is never the play when it comes to maximizing efficiency or whatever. Especially when there are some of us who still paid for that content. I used to say that, like me, you could play for a thousand hours and still not have everything there is to do. This just isn't true anymore, but I wouldn't expect that to be the case after you remove four entire planets, four of the six raids, countless exotic quests, and any number of titles that people were still grinding for to this day. Oh, and you know all those ritual weapons that players move mountains for? Like the Redrix's broadsword I spent upwards of 30 hours worth of crucible matches to get? It'd be unfair to just remove them even though they're not leveled anymore. So tell you what, everyone can just walk to this console in the tower and buy them instead. The Not Forgotten, a gun which I know people have literally ground a hundred hours of comp for is now purchasable at a console near you. That's gonna go over really well. And forget about them adding as much content as they removed, you just got two plants for four, one delayed raid for four we already had, half the strikes I love from the game are gone now, and two ones I don't particularly care for are in their place. They didn't even add a new PvP map for this update. A major update didn't add a new PvP map. And the most offensive part about all of this, Bungie has no excuse. Now I'm not exactly a sizable channel or what one would classify as an influencer, so in all likelihood nobody, least of all Bungie themselves, is gonna see this, so I won't be as pretentious to assume that I'm really reaching the devs here. But if I can contribute to the idea that in any way this is not how you should make games in the year 2020, then maybe I can at least tell myself I'm not part of the problem for buying this piece of trash. Because Bungie, you have no excuse. You made Halo the childhood of countless people across the world and regarded as one of the greatest gaming titles of all time. You made that, Bungie, and when you sold that off and moved on to another title, how did you not learn anything? I used to think that this was Activision implementing all these stupid little cash grabby features like having to progress through a season pass you already paid for or blatantly pay to win implementations, but no, as it turns out, you're just as liable to do it yourself. So yeah, you can't count on me dropping my $70 on your next deluxe expansion because of the steaming dumpster fire this one was for the money I paid. And that may just be the last I'll ever have to say about Destiny. I love this game to death, but it's safe to say that this expansion has broken more than my wallet. For a time, I envisioned a channel of exclusively Destiny content. I made dance videos, montages, and they're widely privated now because copyrighted music and frankly because I was bad at the time. And as much as I still want to, I'm probably not going to get around to doing a Soros Regime gun guide or a subclass school series. So if you've made it all the way through, I'm back to insurgency. 
Look forward to some new videos of content you guys actually subscribed for from a developer that's actually mindful of producing content I don't even have to pay for. That'll be refreshing for sure. Until then, thanks for hearing me out. Sometimes the things that make us the most bitter are from that which used to bring us joy. I guess I'll see you guys in the next one. Snipes out.